Uh, it was uh, January 13th, 2016. It's an article from uh, Time Magazine. It, it wrote, In God We Trust was first added to U.S. coins during the beginning of the Civil War when religious sentiment was on an upswing and concerned Americans wanted the world to know that their country stood for. Many wrote to Secretary of, uh, of the Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, on the matter, and he agreed with their arguments. Congress passed his uh, request, requesting the addition of In God We Trust, adapted from a lesser-known verse from Francis Scott Key's Star Spangled Banner. And the first two-cent coin with the phrase was minted in 1864. Later, uh, in 1955, during the Cold War era, the 84th Congress of the United States passed a joint resolution, which I'd say probably doesn't seem to happen much these days, but to make in God we trust the national motto in the United States. And then a little later, in 1966, the motto appeared on all paper currency in the United States. In God we trust. I mean, something I have, I have seen and heard my entire life. Something that I'd say our nation has forgotten. Something that our states and our, our cities and our communities have ignored. Something the church has twisted and corrupted. Because regardless of what is stamped on our coins, our cultural motto seems to be in self we trust. Like that, that's the motto that's in invading our hearts inside and, and outside of the church. That the problems of this life can be resolved by, you know, just trusting more in yourself as if lack of self-esteem is the reason that we suffer. I mean, let's be honest with each other. You and I are going to go through deeply difficult things in this broken world. And we have a choice to make in that moment. Will we, um, will we trust in self or will we trust in God? And I want to show us from the word why trusting in God has been and always will be uh, the better choice. So this is a message from Psalm 56 about a proclamation in a broken world. If you have a digital Bible, I'll read out of the ESV. If you have a bulletin, it's all there in the bulletin with your notes. But before we read the psalm, uh, let's, let's pray together. God, we uh, humbly come before you and, and confess that we trust in so many things in this life. God, and, and, and we confess that, that our trust is, is so often misguided, that our trust is so often uh, lacking any kind of eternal worth and value. God, and forgive us for, for constantly just trying to trust in ourself as if that's the only answer to our problems. God, I, I, I pray that Psalm 56 would, um, would teach us this morning what it means to, to deeply and truly trust in you, regardless of what's going on around us or even in us. God, uh, teach us what it means to trust in you this morning. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Let me read uh, Psalm 56. And then we'll study together. It begins like this. To the choir master, according to the dove on far off terebinths, a, a miktam of David, when the Philistines seized him in Gath. So verse 1. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me all day long. An attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I'm afraid... I put my trust in you. In God, who, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. Oh, what can flesh do to me? 
all day long. They injure my cause, and all their thoughts are against me for evil. I mean, they stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they've waited for my life. For their crime, will they escape? In wrath, cast down the peoples, O God. And you kept my, my, my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. In God whose word I praise. In the Lord whose word I praise. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. And what can man do to me? So I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. So we begin this morning with another superscription of Psalm 56. This is a miktam of David. There's actually six miktam psalms. So Psalm 16, 56, 57, 58, 59, and 60, which to be fair, we really don't even know how to translate that word miktam or what it means this Uh, is a related word in the Hebrew that means engraving, so it's possible that this song was uh, maybe engraved on tablets. But we don't know what exactly it means, but we can see the, the background of the song this time. It's a song, according to the dove of the far off terebinths of a or a dove of the oak trees, it was written during the time that the Philistines seized David in Gath. And as you've guessed it, let's head back to 1 Samuel. So David is, is the anointed king, okay? But he's still on the run from King Saul. He lands in this area of Gath, the home of Goliath, the giant, and as brave like as David has seemed in the past. We see this, this incredibly strange and fearful moment of him. A moment that like, doesn't scream, this is the brave king, future king of Israel. So 1 Samuel 21 is the context of this psalm. 1 Samuel 21, and I'll start in verse 10. And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. And so he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servant, Behold, you see the man is mad. I mean, why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen? That you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? So, that's the beginning of Psalm 56. David in Gath acting insane, like hoping that the king would get, just get rid of him and do him no harm. Like, isn't it wild how quickly life can unravel? How a, like how a man can be chosen, anointed, slay the giant, and then quickly find himself in, in turmoil among the enemy. That your life, that my life, can be turned upside down with a phone call or or a text message or a news article. The truth is, we live in a broken world. A world that's been fractured and fallen since since Genesis 3. A world that, you know, honestly, just, it it doesn't play nice. So even the great King David wasn't immune from that one. And while we witness a pretty unstable David in Psalm 21, we're thrown into the text of Psalm 56. So this is a psalm of proclamation for those that live in a broken world. Which I would say this is a psalm for all of us. So I want to give us several proclamations from the text this morning because maybe like David, you're going through it and you're really not living your best moment. 
You aren't responding to the challenges of life with like the most grace or wisdom or, or bravery. What do you do? What will, I mean, what will David do? What's our proclamation? Let me share with you from the text and in your notes, if you're a note taker. I proclaim in this broken world, and then point one is when I'm afraid. When I'm afraid. Because look at verse one. Before we fill in the rest of the blanks, be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me that David wastes no time getting to the punch. Be gracious to me, be merciful to me, O God. David realizing in verse 1 that the only answers to horizontal problems are through a vertical plea. Meaning the answer to the problems of the world, I mean, they're just not found in the world. That you might... Like, the, like, that might be your biggest issue right now. You've got so many things going on in and around your life, but you continue to look for answers in the world. I mean, not David. No, he, he looks to the heavens. If anyone was going to do something against a man that tramples all day long or the attacker that presses proudly, it, it wasn't going to be David or any other false hero or idol. It would be the Lord Most High. It would be God that will hear and respond. Simply, you and I, like we better know who to call on in the world. It's the Lord. It's a humble plea knowing God can do whatever he wants because he's God. So see my affliction. See my problems. See what issues I'm dealing with right now. And God, please, just be, be gracious to me. Be merciful to me. Then we get these startling words of David in verse 3. When I'm afraid. <laughs> now, wait, What? David, you can't say that. Don't you remember, David? You've killed a lion and a bear with your own hands. You took down the giant with a sling and a rock. You've taken down the Philistines. What are you so scared of? The truth is, I, I, like, I don't care how tough you think you are or how strong of a Christian you think you are. We're going to be afraid in this life. So, at the beginning of the summer, my oldest son, who's nine years old, he had a pretty, I'd say, fun, unfun experience at the ball field, and his little friend accidentally hit him in the head with a metal bat. So, a uh, huge knot on his forehead and blood gushing out of his right nostril, and um, I didn't see my child and think, well, I'm a Christian, I'm not afraid. No, I, w I was scared, and he went to the emergency room in Johnson City, and they discovered uh, a fracture in the front of his skull, and I didn't say, you know, no big deal, God's got this, I'm not worried. Friends, following Christ doesn't mean the existence of fear will evaporate. Like, you're not being godly by telling everyone you're not afraid. You're just not being honest. So if mighty King David is going to be afraid, well, I, I certainly am sometimes that the existence of, of fear is just the reality of a broken world, but that doesn't mean where it, that's where it stops. David has something to proclaim over his fear, a proclamation for us today. So when I am afraid, let me give you letter A. I will praise his word. I will praise his word. Verse 4, in God whose word I praise. See, the first and most obvious step in a place of fear is to focus our minds on the word of the Lord. Like, what an indictment on my life. With the power of the internet, even as a preacher, like the Bible is often the last place I go to look when I need answers in my fear. Like, no, what is, what's Google say? Or what would chat GPT phrase this? And when, when do the news articles mention this? And what conclusion do the researchers have come to? Like, I'm not saying we become 
uninformed and oblivious children of God. God gave us a brain to use, to research, to reason, to come to conclusions. But the pattern of Psalm 56 and the response of David and the position of fear is to praise the word of the Lord. In fact, it's been this just consistent praise throughout the psalm. So Psalm 12, 6, the words of the Lord, they're pure, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. And then in chapter 19, starting in verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes Psalm 119, 160, the sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Psalm 138, verse 2, when I bow down to your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. When I'm afraid, do I run to the word? Like knowing that what he says is perfect and true, and enduring throughout the ages. And, and listen to the important distinction that David makes in verse 4. He says, well, you know, while in 2023 we should be absolutely reading our Bible, do we praise his word while we do it? That the news often bends information, that the attacker speaks lies, the enemy is just relentless in his speech, the proud seek to destroy. Yeah, I praise the word of the Lord because the word of the Lord is none of that. How often um, a crisis in our life keeps us from the book? As if we don't have time for God when God's the only one that can actually help. Friends, run to your Bible at all times, but certainly when fear is is bubbling in your gut. Read your Bible, praise his word, which will lead us right into letters B and C. When I'm afraid, uh, letter B, I will, I will trust in him. So, end of verse 3, middle of verse 4, I put my trust in you, in God I trust. So, so David, wrapped up in the drama of Gath, Saul chasing him down to put him to death. David has the wisdom to know what God says will come to pass. That, that the holy God of Israel is a trustworthy God. That God has promised David a throne that will never end. So even in the brokenness of his situation, David can still, still trust God to keep his word. And guess what? David's son Solomon, he actually declares that to be true. So when King Solomon takes the throne, he builds a temple for for God to dwell in. And when he he gets done building an altar in the temple for the Ark of the Covenant, and he places it in the most holy of holies, this is what King Solomon proclaims. So this is 1 Kings chapter 8, starting in verse 22. Solomon uh, he, he stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven and said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, be keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart, and you have kept with your servant David, my father, what you declared to him. You spoke with your mouth, and with your hand have fulfilled it this day. Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep your servant David, my father, what you have promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel. If only your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk before me as you walked before me. Now therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father, that the word of the Lord... It's not only praise, but it it can be trusted. It's this resounding drum throughout the entire Bible. Psalm 910, And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Chapter 28, verse 7, The Lord is my strength and my shield, and him my heart trusts. 
and I'm helped, my heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to him. Psalm 112, starting at verse 6, for the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He's not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. Because the truth that's already been mentioned in this life, you're, you're, like you're either going to trust in yourself or you're going to trust in God. And I, I'm probably speaking for everyone when I say this. Um, the person that has let me down the most in this life is me. And I don't know what kind of um, cards you've been dealt some of us, we, we've got a decent hand, and some of us, it's just been a lifetime of hardship. But if I'm going to push all my chips in, then I'm going to give everything to God who's not once let me down. That his word is always true, his promises are always fulfilled. But you know what? You know, it's, it's still scary. Things are not always easy, and there's, there's still that lingering fear. Which is why I love the, the complex and the profound truth of verses 3 and 4. So when I'm afraid, let me give you letter C, I will not be afraid. And that's not a contradiction. It's a decision of what kind of truth will reign in your life. When I am afraid, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Again, the problem is not the existence of fear. I mean, that's a, just a normal reaction to any threat or uncertainty in this life. The question is rather, will that fear reign over your life? Will being afraid become the God that you bow down to? I mean, watching um, people you love suffer is scary. Waiting for a diagnosis is, is scary. Knowing someone wants to hurt you is scary. Thinking about all the things that you don't know about the future is scary. And yet, when I'm afraid, I won't be afraid. Again, that's not just some made-up thought from David and Gath. Psalm 23, 4, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff that comfort me. Psalm 27, 1, Of David, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 34, Verse 4, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Psalm 118, 6, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? David is saying, look, I'm going to speak the truth of the word over the current state of my emotions. It's a reminder of a dad that, that, that just so deeply wanted miraculous healing for his boy. And Jesus tells him, in Mark's gospel, well, you know, all things are possible for the one who believes. And the father responds, I believe, but help my unbelief. Like, I'm not afraid, but help me when I'm afraid. See, faith over fear, it's not like stirring up some weird kind of religious emotion. Faith over fear is speaking the truth of the word over the current reality of your emotions. So when I'm afraid, I will not be afraid. Because I remember that like, there's no flesh nor man can harm me. It's this bold Christ follower's claim, kill the body and I will rise again. So yeah, sure, we, we'll be afraid sometimes. And yet we will not be afraid. We live in a broken world full of broken people. David, he understands that looking at the description of verses 5 through 7. All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps. They've waited for my life. You're the God full of justice. Show your wrath on them. So like we've seen the mighty king David afraid 
and rightly so, but look at what the careful words are of verse 8. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? I proclaim in this broken world, let me give you point two, um, when I'm grieving. I grew up in church. Um, I've been to Bible college and seminary. I've heard and read verse 8 a thousand times. It just never clicked for me that that was David, the anointed king, pushed to his limits. We all have a limit. Sometimes life gets so overwhelming, it seems to crush us within. 1991, uh, Columbia Pictures released one of the world's saddest movies. And the plot involved an 11-year-old girl uh, that fell in love with a boy that just happened to be allergic to everything. And after a series of events, the boy is killed by an allergic reaction to a swarm of bees while they sat under a willow tree. And I remember watching that movie and, and seeing that girl walk up to Thomas's casket and she's just so overwhelmed with emotions that she takes off running in tears. And I remember uh, watching that movie and then uh, running to the bathroom to cry. <laughs> and uh, I was embarrassed. Like, I didn't want... I didn't want, want anyone to know I was crying during the movie, which is probably the first time I've ever publicly shared that with anyone. So you're, you're, I mean, you're welcome. Um, but I, I think about the deepest of our sufferings in our life, and so often our response is not on public display. It's, it's the countless nights tossing in your bed, like just just filled with anxiety and worry and, and fear and sadness that no one sees. It's the, the tears that are shed when no one's looking, when no one sees the amount of times that you've cried out before the Lord. And, and the beautiful imagery of, of Psalm 56 is this reminder that the private suffering of God's children, well, that has been noticed by the Heavenly Father. That God, he knows the exact number of sleepless nights that you've had. That God has kept safe your tears. That God has recorded all of the sufferings in his book. The point is, he is a caring and present and loving God. He's not distant. He's, he's so close to us that he has a record of, of it all. I mean... Even if no one knows about the dark things you've gone through, the Lord knows, and he, he loves you, and he cares for you, and those sleepless nights and those tears, they're just never wasted. So what's our proclamation when we grieve? And, well, you know, maybe you figured it out already. Um, but it's the exact same proclamation from point one. So when I grieve, the law, the law will be on the screen here. When I grieve, A, I will praise his word. When I can't sleep, I'll run to his word. I'll, I'll read my Bible even when I'm filled with heart, heartache. When I grieve, I'll trust in him. When my eyes are filled with tears, I'll trust in him, reminded of Revelation 21.4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Even though I know grief is real, my grief has an end date. So when I grieve, I will not be afraid. In the text... Verses 10 through 11, in God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid, what can man do to me? That grief is real, that sleepless nights are real, that tears are real, but I just refuse to be afraid. I refuse to, to fear anything or anyone but, but God alone. So when I grieve, I'll, I won't be afraid. As most of you know, um, I was pretty sick about two weeks ago. 
Um, I don't know what I had. I tested negative uh, for everything, strep, flu, COVID, tested negative for COVID twice, and uh, just felt miserable for about six days with a fever I could not shake. And I'm thankful for this church uh, that showed me and just continues to show me a ton of grace. Um, But I was about four days into not feeling well, feeling pretty miserable. And I just had this deep conviction. Um, I couldn't get out of bed, but I could watch a little TV. I couldn't get out of bed, um, but I could read some of the book that I had been working on and it was around day four that that conviction really hit me strongly that, you know, I haven't, I haven't read my Bible at all. I hadn't, I mean, I even haven't done the basic, like, just pray and ask God to help me feel better. Just laid there, felt sorry for myself, and didn't acknowledge God at all. And to be incredibly transparent, like, I didn't even feel like it. Didn't want to. I mean, it's just so sad how one little ounce of suffering in our life can derail so much of our faith. So I'm, I'm deeply convicted of the words of verse 12. I must perform my vows to you, O God, and I will render thank offerings to you. Because on the surface, that just doesn't make sense to me. Wouldn't, wouldn't God understand if David took a little break? I mean, after all, I mean, God knows. He knows that this world can be messed up. Afraid that the enemy might kill him, grieving over countless suffering. So verse 12 is, is just so incredibly countercultural, even in the life of the church. Because the truth is, like, we don't take breaks or vacations or timeouts from honoring the Lord. Whether, whether life is as great as it's ever been for you, or whether you're held up in enemy, enemy territory, whether you're healthy and happy, or whether you're afraid and tired and full of grief, in all things I must give thanks to God. That's your main point. That's our, that's our main proclamation in this broken world. In all things, I must give thanks to God. It's not a matter of if you and I feel like it. It's a matter of submission. I must perform my vows to you, O oh God. I will render thank offerings and sacrifices to you. Why, like, why would I do that? Why would I do something like that when I have so much going on around me because of what Christ has done on our behalf. Because Christ has delivered my soul from death. That's not just some future date for David or us in the passage. That's an already but not yet reality that Christ has delivered my soul from death today. Because Christ has kept my feet from eternally falling that I might walk in the light of life. So... Yeah, regardless of what this broken world wants to throw at you or me, um, I will proclaim in all things I must give thanks to God. So let's pray together. God, we we do acknowledge um, that there is hard things in this life. That there's not a person in this room or a person that will ever listen to this, that, that just, they live long enough, they're going to go through it. God, the countless sleepless nights, physically hurting, emotionally hurting, for, for all the tears that are shed when no one even knows. And no one sees. God, you see, you see it all. So God, we, we pray that, um, that our, our proclamation in all things, life going great 
or life is, is not going so great, God, we pray in all things we will give thanks to you. Knowing that, that if we believe, if we have faith, that, that Christ has truly saved our soul from death today. And, and that's the greatest thing that we could proclaim in a, in a broken world. And so, uh, God, remind us of your word constantly, and we will just submit to that. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen.